you so much. I want to say something a little bit dangerous, a dangerous idea. There is no shortage of good ideas in this world. We have good ideas to last us another 300 years. The thing we can't do is make good ideas powerful in the world. And the world will only change when the lovely ideas that we have become powerful. All of us in this room believe in kindness, in trust, in compassion, in generosity, in beauty. These are things that all nice people all over the world agree on. And yet, these are things that the modern world is not very good at implementing. Why not? Because we are too focused on the idea and not focused enough on the implementation. The world is too full of geniuses alone in their bedrooms. They sit in their bedrooms, they have wonderful ideas, and maybe, maybe they write a book and they hope to change the world through a book. I have bad news for anyone here, me included, who's written a book. The world does not change through books. A book cannot, on its own, change anything. The only way in which change comes is when people group together and start institutions. We are unfortunately in love with the idea of the lone genius who comes down from the mountain to tell us something we've never heard before and who will change the world. This isn't actually a good model. The model of the lone genius does not change the world. Um, I think that the number one institution which will show us the way and I am an atheist, but I'm a different sort of atheist to the atheist you heard this morning. The atheist you heard this morning was atheism 1.0. I'm atheism 2.0, okay? Now, what is atheism 2.0? Atheism 2.0 says, of course, God doesn't exist. But now what? What do we do with the fears, the longings, the anxieties, all the things that drove us to religion, they haven't disappeared simply because we've noticed some logical inconsistencies in the tale of the loaves and the fishes. The doubts and the dilemmas and the fears carry on. Religion has been the most powerful institution that has spread ideas through the world. And because I'm interested in ideas being powerful, I want to look at how, I, how religions educate us. If we talk all the time about education, there's only one machine in this world that has ever educated people really powerfully, and that's religions. I don't believe in the content of religions, but I'm very interested in the mechanism. Now, education is taken to be a very important thing. Everyone always talks, politicians, um, parents. Education will change us and save us. It's a beautiful idea. There's almost an idea there that religion is maybe no longer so powerful in the hearts of men and women, and, religion and education will take the place of it. You know, in Europe in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century, the number of people who believed in God went down very sharply. And people said, where are we going to get all the stuff that people used to get from religion? The meaning, the consolation, the sense of right and wrong, the sense of community, where is this going to come from? in philosophy, in history, in literature, in theater, in poetry. There is everything there. There is consolation, there is meaning, there is a sense of community. It's all waiting for us. In other words, culture can replace scripture. That was the dream of the secularizing West in the 19th century, and it's because of that dream that we're here today. We are the heirs of that dream. People who believe that culture, coming here together, this is a church. It's a church, but without God. And nevertheless, something has gone badly wrong with this dream, I believe. Um, if you went to any university, any museum, any institution of higher culture in the modern world, and you said, look, I've come to study at Harvard, or at Yale, or the University of Oxford, or in Mexico City, any great university, and you said, I've come to study culture. And they said, why? And you say, because I'm lost, because I'm scared, because I'm mortal, because I don't know how to run a relationship, because I'm full of anguish. They would look at their watch and go, this person is really crazy. Please leave the office or I call the police. In other words, we are not allowed to bring the suffering heart to culture. We are not. If you went to a museum and you started crying in front of a Velasquez or a Kiefer or a Jasper Johns or a Mark Rothko, the guards would be getting you out. 
You are not allowed to bring your deeper self. Why? Because elite culture has a view that life is basically quite simple. All you need to do in life is uh, separate yourself from your parents, grow up, maybe uh, start a relationship with someone new, find a job that you love, um, watch the onset of mortality in your parents' generation and then in your generation, and then when time has come to die, you put yourself in the coffin, shut the lid, and off you go to the next, well, to nothing. Uh, there is no next world, remember? Uh, and, uh, and there you go. Isn't that easy? No, it's not. Of course it's not easy. There's a lot of anguish and suffering, and where do we take that? Well, the standard answer is you must be a bit stupid if you find life difficult. And if you're stupid and American, then you should go and read self-help books. Because self-help books will tell you how to live and how to be happy and how to die and all the rest of it. But those are for stupid people. So what do intelligent people do? Well, they have no real problem. They don't need a problem. They don't need a solution to this. Well, I don't know about you. You're all very intelligent. You don't read self-help books, but do you need help? Yes, of course you do. We all do. Outside of religion, we need help. Secular culture, the way it's currently arranged, is not enough. The way we're teaching things, the way we teach art and culture, is not enough. We're not doing it properly. Um, there are two reasons, really, why we live and the, why we invest our hopes in. There are two things we really live for. The first one is love, and the second one is work. Right? Those are the two modern dreams. We want a good relationship, and we want a flourishing, working life. Now, for most of human history, people had no expectations of love and work. Does anyone in, the, in this room love the person they're married to? Anyone love the person they're married to? A lot of hands. This is really weird, right? If you, if you scrolled back 300 years and you said, you must love the person you are married to. Oh, love? No, no, I have children, maybe. Get on just about, but love? No. Nowadays, we want love. We want sex, we want companionship with the people we love. And in work, we want not just money, but we want fulfillment. We want to be ourselves, we want to be creative. Oh, it's very, very hard, the dreams of love and work. How many of you get a little bit sad on a Sunday evening? I get sad on a Sunday evening. Sunday evening is a time for sadness because the day begins the next week and you're thinking, hmm, how are these projects going, love and work? is often a problem. With me, it's always a problem in either one or the other. Why? We are alone with our problems. We do not have a structure to give guidance. And this is a huge problem in the modern world. There are great answers in books, but the answer is sitting on the library shelves. So my recommendation is really a new system of education that one of the things it would teach is emotional intelligence and well-being. It sounds so strange. It sounds so odd, it sounds wishy-washy, but what I mean is we need to raise people who understand themselves, who know what to do with their anxieties, who know how to run a relationship. These, this, these are parts of the arts of living. We have given up on the idea that education should be part of the art of living. It absolutely should be. How would education change? Well, at the moment we have this very weird idea in education, that if you tell someone a good idea just once when they're about 20, it'll stay in their mind forever. You will never need to do anything else. They just, you know, you fill up somebody with a jug of, of intelligence, and then it just stays with them. Now, religions, let's look at how religions educate people. Religions are obsessed with the idea that we forget everything. You tell someone something in the morning, and by lunchtime, they've forgotten it. And by evening, they need another reminder. And that's why all religions tell us to repeat things all the time. You must be good, you must be good, you must be good. Because if you just hear it once, it goes dead in your mind. So repetition. And religions give us calendars so that every day will be given over to a certain idea. We are very forgetful. Our minds are full of brilliant ideas. But unless someone says, oh, think about that idea today, we will forget. Think of how lovely springtime is, right? We all love the spring, don't we? We love seeing flowers for the first time. We love seeing the new seasons. This is a very normal, customary thing. Now, in culture, there are lots of poems and songs and lots of lovely things about spring. But the problem is most of us don't really pay much attention to these when the time is there. If you are Jewish, once a year, there is something called the festival of Birkat Hilahot, where a rabbi takes you and makes you say a prayer in a field looking at new flowers and new blossom on the trees. In other words, it doesn't leave your inner life to just you. 
The community is part of your inner life. Religions understood this. We have privatized the inner life, and that's why there are full of things that we love to do and that we like to think about, but that we don't give any time to in a structured way in a busy world. This is a major failing of the modern world. It's connected a little bit to art. Now, art in the modern world is a really confusing area. To be a serious person is to love art. But what is art for? This is often the question we ask ourselves when we're in the gallery, we're looking down the museum steps, we think, what was that strange installation art, that piece of video art? Well, we can't really understand it. Now, I look back to religions. What do religions use art for? It's propaganda, okay? What's it propaganda for? It's propaganda for the beliefs of the religion, okay? Now, I think that's a really good idea. So you look in front of it, you look at a Rembrandt, and he's giving you a, a piece of propaganda on behalf of courage or virtue or feminine modesty or something, and it is essentially a giant program of advertising. What are, what are advertising? What does advertising sell us now? Chocolate bars, uh, sandals, radios, things we don't need, right? The most important things are not systematically addressed through any artistic process. And this is a desperate weakness of modern society. When you walk around, when you see posters and things, they are constantly drawing your attention to things which you don't actually need. So artists working for religions knew they had a very simple message. Make your religion great. Fix the religion in the mind of the believer. We don't have a new secular religion, but we have lots of very good ideas about how we should live. We should be kind, we should be compassionate, we should be just, we should be slow to anger. You, I could go on and on. There are lots of things we believe in, all of us as a society, but we forget them. When the time comes, we forget them. And the reason, part of the reason why we forget them is because there is nothing to systematically remind us in the way that art was used by religions. So let's get the artists working in the, in the name of psychology our own psychology, in the same way as for hundreds of years, artists worked in the name of theology. There's another area we need to look at, which is the media. The media is the teacher, okay? We have, in, in most countries, in, in Mexico, in, in the UK, there is someone who looks after the media in the government and someone who looks after education, right? And it's a different person. This is crazy, right? Most people, once you've left school, once you've left university, in other words, for most of your life, you will be educated not in a classroom, but by the media, okay? And when you want to start a revolution, where do you go? Do you drive your tank to the homes of the poets and the homes of the philosophers and the homes of the artists? No. You go first to the newspaper and then the television station. That's how you start a revolution. This is something that we really neglect. There are wonderfully powerful ideas out there, but we don't hear about them because they have none of the power of mass media. If ideas are to be powerful in the world, they must be harnessed to mass media. It's my dream one day to start a philosophical mass media station. It's not as crazy as it sounds, but we should do it. We should do it. Join me. Join me in doing it. We should do it. Um, Plato famously said that the world would only be right when kings became philosophers or philosophers' kings. What he was saying with that idea was something which resonates to this day. There is no point having the good ideas in this corner and the microphone and the megaphone and the screen on the other and no connection. If media is truly the most powerful thing, what have we done to surrender the minds of our children, the minds of the population at large, to a mechanism of, of, of um, transmission which is so obviously shallow? We need to get more serious about the ideas we put in other people's heads. The major responsibility. <laughs> then, of course, the, the criticism people will say is, the criticism people will say is, but you can't make any money that way, right? Whenever I start to dream big dreams, people always say to me, but you can't make any money. Now listen, the way that you make money is to serve the needs of the human beings. There are two ways that you can serve a human being. You can either serve their desires or their needs. The desire for running shoes, for extra pizza that will make them sick, for a phone they don't really want, right? You can satisfy those desires and you can make some money. But the really big money is being able to sell things to people that they really need.
okay? And this we are only just beginning. Capitalism in its, is in its very infancy. We have learned nowadays how to sell people running shoes and pizzas. We do not know yet how properly to make businesses that will sell people the deepest things that they need. You know, the, one of the biggest businesses in the world today should be marriage therapy. Is everybody here in a happy relationship? Or has anyone here got any problems at all? Any, any problems? Yes, some hands are going up. Some people have some problems. Now, what do you need more? What do you think is more important? The problem, the problem that you haven't got any, any running shoes or the problem that your relationship is not going well? Okay, let me answer that question for you. It's the, it's the relationship that's the problem, okay? But businesses haven't known how to harness this, okay? So it's my prediction that in 50 years, on the New York Stock Exchange, one of the largest organizations should and will be psychotherapy. At the moment, psychotherapy is a joke. It's run by strange people with odd accents from their bedrooms. This should not be the case. We should make the best ideas powerful, and that means harnessing them to the engines of capitalism, something we're only just beginning and learning uh, uh, to do. So let me sum up the way I think we need to change the world. One, we have the ideas already. Stop writing books on justice and freedom and truth. We know what justice and freedom and truth are, okay? We just don't know how to make them real. So we have a problem of transmission, not a problem of intellectual discovery. We've done the intellectual discovery. We need to make ideas powerful in the world. So we need to change the way people are educated. We need to change the curriculum. We need to understand that what people are suffering with are the problems that they are mortal and that they have a very strong desire for communion with one other person in a romantic relationship, and this is very hard. And they want work, which is not only pays them money, but fulfills their soul. This is very hard. We need to start systematically addressing this in the education system. Um, we need to rearrange the way that art is structured. Let's get art out of the museum and into the street. The definition of art as something that lives in a museum is a dead one. Art is advertising for the most important ideas in the world. It currently isn't, but it should and can be. We need to remake the mass media, and we need to remake capitalism to serve not desires, but needs in a way that will be profitable. These are tiny ideas, and we've got time. We've got two minutes, 24 seconds. Um, we will have time to address these. I want to direct your attention to the challenge before us, which is not just the discovery of the truth, but the challenge of making the truth effective in the world. I'm going to stop it there, but I've got two minutes with Andres, who's going to come and ask me some questions. But thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. <clears throat> Your mic's gone dead. Speak into mine. Speak into mine. Hello. Hello. Well, I think I will need to speak through you. Yeah. No, no, I think it's working. Bueno, bueno, bueno. It's working. First of all, before I ask you two questions in relation to your future books. Yeah. Well, he's writing a book now about secrets. And also, he's writing an essay or a kind of a book about marriage. What could you tell us actually about the importance of secrets in marriage within our relation with our spouses? Yeah, and look, I'm just writing a, a piece here about secrets. And normally, secrets are seen as a very bad thing. Why do people lie? Okay, imagine the typical situation. The wife has had an affair with her gym teacher. She comes back to the husband. She doesn't say it was a wonderful night. It was great fun, but she doesn't say. Why is she lying? Okay, why is she lying? The normal answer is she's a bad person, okay? That's an inadequate answer. Every time you have a lie, you have two people. You have the liar and the person who has set up the situation that they cannot accept the truth, and therefore they are being lied to, okay? So it's very important whenever someone starts to lie, you see this with children, don't set the bar of the truth so high that people need to start lying to you, right? Let's not have an image of being a good person that is so demanding that most of us have to lie when we don't come up to it. It is, it is a responsibility not just of the person who has transgressed, but also of the community around to understand our real nature so that there will be less lies. Li lying is not just the problem of the liar, it's also the problem of the audience. Well. After the first debate, a great encounter of the century that we had today yeah. in the morning between Dawkins and Chopra. If I understand correctly, 
What you're trying to tell us is Dawkins is telling us there is no God at all. But what you're telling us is, A, that's not enough. People need to believe things, need things to survive. Look, and if you just tell them there's nothing at all and you don't give them like something to take instead, you won't solve the problem? I, I, I mean, understand I correct. have the highest respect for Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is a truly great man. However, there is a problem in his approach. And the problem is this. He is trying to tell people that believing in religion is a, is a fault, is an intellectual error. I agree. However, he is not at all sympathetic or even interested in the cognitive frailties and emotional needs which have led people to a lie. He simply wants to show people the truth and leave it there. I'm, I think this is only the beginning of the project. The real direction of the project, once you've agreed that God doesn't exist, this is only the beginning. You still have someone who is terrified of death, okay, who is very worried about their status, who is very worried about love, who is very worried uh, about the whole business of living. What do you have? You know, think of the Virgin Mary, okay? the Virgin Mary in, in Catholicism. At one level you think, look, she didn't exist. She didn't exist, so why believe in her? She's ridiculous. You know, we've disproved, she obviously wasn't a real person. End of story. No, what is the Virgin Mary? The Virgin Mary is the maternal comfort that all of us need because life is terrifying. We need a mummy, an imaginary mummy, uh, to hug us and to make us feel more comfortable because life is terrifying. Now, I, my question to Richard Dawkins with the highest respect is, where's the mummy? We need the mummy. We need a, a replacement But what, one figure. second. And what about if we will lie ourselves again? What would be the answer? Art? We don't have to lie. We can say, right, my view of the modern, believer, the, the modern non-believer is this. I'm terrified of dying. Right now, if I believed, I would like an angel to come and give me a hug. I don't believe, but I take very seriously my desire for an angel to come and give me a hug. I don't believe, but I understand what I want. This, I think, is a, an enlight a truly enlightened person. It's too simple to say, angels don't exist. It's like, okay, look, I know angels don't exist. I'm suffering. I have to die.